any social network with the person who's in charge of this thing because it's not showing anything. Oh, there it is, it's turning on, I think. Starting. There we go. Now we have a countdown and are we good? We're good, thank you. Um, where, when is this scheduled? Is it now? Is it exactly now? Damn it. All right. I'm going to really have to pee after. Um, can someone shut the lights here? Is that possible? Is anyone in charge? Does anyone see the light switch? Nothing. Sorry? Oh, there we go. Can, you, can we see this? All right, let's hope that the... Uh, no? <laughs> no? No, no, no. That wasn't the right ones. Maybe it's here? Let's... Let's try this. There we go. Is this better? No. Yes and no. Th th that means no. All right. Fuck it. Let's do this. All right. So, I'm Sawyer. Hi. Um, I've noticed some of the people who are here. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. Some of the people who registered. You're kind of in the wrong place. I'm sorry. Uh, basically, what I wanted to do is give a very uh, introduction, introductory uh, talk to asynchronous programming. So hopefully it won't bore you too much. But if you don't know asynchronous programming, this is for you. How many people here do not program in asynchronous code? Like, asynchronously. All right, great, you're in the wrong, right place, okay. So, let's see, yeah. So I'm gonna start with a conversation that uh, happens a lot of the time between me and one of my parents, sisters, brothers, uncles, whatever, who it is, whoever it is. And let me know if this sounds familiar. It starts with my dad calling me and says, hi. And I say, hi, dad. And he says, got a minute? And I say, yes. I'm looking for a movie. Where should I start? Well, you go to the cinema website. What's the address? WW, whatever, whatchamacallit, blah, whatever. Just a sec. I have to wait. And I 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 go, well. And he says, it loaded. What do we do now? You click on new movies. Okay. And I wait some more. Well, he says, well, it's loading. You can hear him clicking and what now? Well, you find the movie you want. Then what? You click on it. You'll get instructions. Don't, you know, and eternity passes by. Well, and he goes, just a sec, it's loading. And this is the point where I just shoot myself. This is a 30-minute conversation. <laughs> I am not kidding. Has this ever happened to you? Let's illustrate it, because basically this is programming. It goes like this. This is programming. So if I use mechanize, if you don't, if you don't know what it is, check it out in Meta CPAN. It's really cool. I do a get for a URL, and then I check if it's successful. Then I click on new movies. Then I check if that was successful. And then I find uh, inputs, uh, which are the movies and whatever it is. I want to try this conversation again. This is how I would like to converse with my uh, family members. It doesn't work, but I'll try. Hi. Hi, Dad. Got a minute? Yes. I'm looking for a movie. What should I do? And I answer, go to this website, click on new movies, pick the movie you want, and click on it. He says, thank you. I say, you're very welcome, and I hang up. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't show. There's a picture of Freddie Mercury here doing this thing, and it doesn't... Damn it. All right. So let's take a look at callbacks. Callbacks are references to a code that you pass as an argument, and then whichever code you pass it along to can call this. It looks kind of like this. Um, I hope you can see this. I'm going to read it. So there's a subroutine here. Try something. It gets an input, and it gets a callback, CB. And then it does some operation using that input, which receives a result. And then it checks the status for the result, if it's OK or something else. And then it uses that callback, that reference. It dereferences it, calls it, because it's code, and then sends it some more stuff. And then we can use try something later on, where we give it some input and a, a, a code reference that gets content and does stuff with it. This is callbacks. This is very useful. This is how this conversation would look if mechanized with async. So I get the cinema URL, and I give it a code 
to run in case it's successful. Let's assume we're all talking about just successful results. So I give it a callback that will then use Mechanize to click on movies, and that gets another callback, that, which then would find inputs, and that gets another callback, which would get the movies as more input. Why is this successful? First of all, you allow others to decide if something is good or bad. If you take a look at Juno, this is a library that I wrote with a person named Adam. He's not here right now. He really wanted to come. Um, Juno is a library for testing things. So in this example, we have two hosts that we're checking, and we're going to run fping on it, which is basically ping. And I give it on success, I give it a subroutine to run, which gets input and then does some more stuff. And then I have an on fail, which gets input and then does some more stuff. And the cool thing is that Juno decides if something, if something worked or not. In the case of fping, it could be that the resolve for uh, a name, um, host name did not work. It could be that the IP is not responding. It could be a certain packet loss. Fping does that, and Juno does that above it. If I have HTTP, it could be that I got some, uh, um, an HTTP code other than to something, which is usually fail. So you can let other people do that. You just give them your code, and you decide to run it or not. Why is this useful? Well, it allows stepping, basically iterating. I wrote something called algorithm diff callback. Who here uses algorithm diff ever? Great, so you know how annoying it is. It's very good, but it's annoying because it returns a lot of output. It returns everything. And then you have to iterate over that and just loop over it and was this added, was this removed, was this changed? Is, it's annoying. So I wrote algorithm diff callback because I needed to have someone else run this stuff for me, and I needed stepping. I needed to run it each time and not take the whole hash of results. And just, did it change? Run this. This is how it looks. It has diff arrays and diff hashes. This is an example I give. Um, I'm a crass person. This is, this, these are my examples. So uh, diff arrays, I give it two arrays, and then I give it two code references to run, one in case something is added, and one in case something is removed. And it will run those code references whenever it sees something. And it will run them as soon as it sees something that changes, and it will consume much less memory because it doesn't have to take the entire change set into account. This is how hashing uh, difference looks. Um, so you have three callbacks. I should probably change it to a hash. Um, so there you go. Why is this useful? You allow control of some of your decisions to a different process, which is basically what IOC gives you. And you allow asynchronous code. Let's take a look at that. Asynchronous code starts from an event loop. It really is just a loop. So imagine a while one running. And you register events that that while can run each time it steps into the loop. And it runs them, and it lets the user register even, register even more events. OK? Let's take a look at that. My events, just a stupid example, my events, and then there's some code references there. And while one, whenever I see events, I just run them. That's very simple. Can anyone see the problem here? You cannot add new events because it's, events is not defined before it is defined with the events, so you cannot really add more to events. Nice. But let's change it. Okay, so we have events, and then we put stuff in there, and then we can add, you can put callbacks to add events. This is using time. Let's suppose that I want to run things at a certain time, so each event could have a key of the time, and then I check if the time has passed, or it's now the time, and then I'm gonna run it, and this is fairly simple. This is how event loops work, basically, all of them. And suppose I want to let a user add new events, I do sub add event, and then there's time and code, and he just, I just push into the event with an ID of some sort, whatever. So what kind of events do we have in an event loop? First of all, we have timers. Timers can be one time thing, where I say I want something to run at 3 p.m. exactly, that's it. It could be a recurring, I want, I want it to run every five minutes, or every 10 minutes, or every day, like a cron job, whatever. And it could be the replacement for sleep, because you can't really do sleep, because otherwise, if I, in the while I'll have sleep, the while is going to get stuck. So instead, if I want to sleep for a while, I'll just say, schedule the next event for a certain time. And we have I.O. Input output includes disk operations. For me, I know this is simplified, but this is how I want to present it. 
um, input output, which means disk operations, networking, anything that basically, like HTTP calls, what Mechanize does, that's IO, if you're reading a file or writing one, that's IO, and all these things are blockers, so you have to put them into the events. So let's, let's do some programming. I want to start with IO async. IO async has a loop interface, IO async loop, and you can connect hosts to it, you can add listeners to it, which can be handlers, sockets, what have you. And you can explicitly call run when you're ready. Here's an example. I'm using IO async stream, IO async loop. I have a loop here, and then I connect stuff to it. In this case, this is a stream socket, and there's an event here I'll show later on stream. It does stuff whenever it gets something. There's a, there's a loop that's going to run there, and whenever it sees some stream, it's going to run the code, and I have some code for errors. <coughs> and then in the end, I run if, uh, loop run. On stream looks like this. <sighs> kind of, this was a bit difficult for me. Um, so I configure this, I get the stream as an input, then I configure it to have more events, and it just reads a line there. And then it, at the end, it writes a line to the stream, and it adds that stream to the loop, so the loop will have that stream as well. Let me give you another smaller example by Paul Evans, the guy who wrote IO async. This is a command line, this is IO async HTTP. I add to IO async an HTTP um, object, and then I just wait for events that are mapping for get requests from a list of URLs. Why not? Fairly simple. Let me, let's talk about Poe. Poe has a loop interface of Poe kernel. It runs sessions. Each session is of type Poe session. And each session is basically a context of events. If in IO async you just had a bunch of events going off, Poe tries to encapsulate this in a session and in a context, which means that each session has its own ID and each session has its own hip, which is like a stash for preserving things that are related to that context. And you can call events either in a current post session or in a different post session. And when you're done, you have to call uh, po kernel run explicitly. Here's an example. Use po, which automatically gives you po kernel and post session and a bunch of constants. And I can just create a loop here that creates po sessions, 10 po sessions. And they have inline states, which is the way po sessions, if you want to say, here are the states that you have. You have very different ways of doing it. And inline states is the most basic one. It maps um, the names of events to actual code. That's the simplest it can get. So start, increment, and stop. Now, start and stop, you'll notice that it starts with an underscore. The reason it starts with an underscore is because those events are known to Po as events that it will actually use automatically without you calling it. It's going to call start as soon as it starts the kernel or a session with a kernel already running, and it's going to call stop as soon as it's done. It cannot really run a session without anything going in there, so you're going to have to have your code start somewhere. That's underscore start. Let's take a look at uh, the event, the handlers. This is start. I get a kernel hip in session, and I'm using hash sli um, array slices here. I hope it doesn't confuse anyone. Basically, uses kernel hip in session, which are constants, so it asks for the kernel length item and the hip item and the session. And these are objects that I can use. And then I just print the ID. I have a count there, which is related to that specific session. Very comfortable. And then I use the kernel to yield an increment. It basically says, call increment, which is an event. And it has to be defined somewhere. It's defined there, increment. It's going to call increment on that specific session. Then we have the handle increment, which gets the kernel hip session, and then it does a, a print to the ID, and it connects to, it shows the count, and it adds another one to it. And then if it's done, it's not going to do anything. But if it's not done, if the count is under 10, it's going to call increment once more. So it's just going to loop over that thing 10 times. And this is a stop just saying, we're stopped, we're done. This is how it all looks at the same time. Um, it's a bit big, but it provides a lot of flexibility that I'm going to talk about in a bit. 
a bit more condensed, I'm sorry, line wrapping here, but um, there's a few ways to condense it. Reflex, has anyone heard about reflex? Has anyone used reflex? Seriously. <laughs> if bingo's going this, all right. So reflex was written by the author of Poe, and this is how he describes it. He said, this is how Poe would look if I had moose. But I didn't have moose, now I do. I'm gonna write it the way I want to. And it stresses composability and reusability. It includes a lot of additional roles. It's not just components. With Poe, it was Poe component something. Here, it's actual roles. And this is an example using moose, where I have an application which extends the reflex base, and it uses an interval and a watched trait. And then I can just set a, set a new ticker that is an interval type, and the setup gives it an interval of one and repeats it once, and it just ticks. So that's, um, that's the uh, on ticker tick um, subroutine that's already um, mapped to an event, and it just checks. That's it. And then I just exit. The exit here is obviously not going to have as good as the loop. So I create a new instance of this application and I run using run all. So this, is, this might be complicated to some people. So here's a different example. Using reflex interval, I can just create a new reflex interval with some parameters and say, on tick, do this. That's it. Fairly simple. And it's going to run loop once I start run all. Let's talk about any event. Any event is very thin, it's very fast. It was written in order to support as many loops as possible that conform to the author's rules of compatibility. Some of you might know what I mean. The idea is that um, any event could use other event loops. And you use any event syntax to say, these are events that should run, but I want you to use this event loop for it. And it's going to use that one. And then if you have code that you need to run under GTK, which has its own event loop, you could use any event and say, just use GTK instead. But I'll write any event and you use GTK instead and it works. The thing is that the other um, event loops that I showed pretty much support others as well. So nowadays it doesn't serve that much of a purpose to use specifically any event for this. Po supports a lot of event loops, some that any event doesn't support. And so does IO async. So it doesn't, it's not that much of a statement now. It does not use a loop handler. That is, you don't call run or start or all of that. It just runs, OK? It's not necessarily a good thing. This is part of the problem with compatibility to other event loops that Poe ran into and has the run all. And it uses a lot of conditional variables, which are supported in reflex. I just didn't get into it. And there's AE, if you've seen it. It's an alternative namespace that comes with any event, and it's a bit faster because it doesn't use, use method call. So an example of any event. I have a count here that's zero. I create a condition variable. I create a timer. The timer runs after two seconds. First two seconds, it doesn't count. Then it runs at every 0 0.6 seconds. And there's a callback here that's just going to print the time increment the counter, check if it's 10, and sends to the condition variable. The condition variable took me some time to understand, but it's, it's actually fairly simple. The condition variable sets a condition on receive that says, as long, as soon as I hit receive, I'm waiting in this position until someone does send. So what happens here is that I have a counter here, then on 10 we'll call send, then I do receive. And now it's just, just gonna wait on that line until the timer goes 10 times and calls send and then receive gets it and the code continues running. And this point does allow for other things to run at the same time. It does, it's kind of like sleep. Um, this is an example of IO operations. I have uh, any event IO and I use a file handler to STD in and I pull for readability, so that's like read operation and a callback that chomps the input. What is that? Why? Damn it. <laughs> Ignore that thing. It's HTML and fucking up my Perl code. Um, so it prints the 
the read input and it undefs the watcher itself. I won't go into why you would want to do that though. So some usages for asynchronous code is GUI. GUI, for example, runs on loops. You gotta have something that allows the user to do things while they're doing other things. So you have a loop there that says, draw the button, but allow for events of other buttons being clicked, or resizability, or a bunch of stuff. So GUI runs on loops, and almost every GUI library has its own loop handler. Fortunately, um, most ev event loops that we have in Perl support other event loops, so you can write Perl using any event or PO and have it run GTK code, which is really cool. Because then, if you were so inclined to do, you could write an application uh, implementation in a, a Perl event loop, pure Perl event loop, and then have different outputs, and then your code would work on WX and GTK and I won't get into that though. Services needed, if you have an HTTP daemon, it's gonna have to serve more than one per person at a time, hopefully, right? Um, we're talking about 1K, that's 1,000 at a second. Let's start with more than one, and you have to have asynchronous code to run more than one. Nginx is written in asynchronous code. Some use pre-forking where they just fork to a few in advance, and then you have a few processes. But mainly in sequence code is, I think, one of the better um, implementations, better ways of doing it. And you can use pre-forking and asynchronous code, which is awesome. SMTP needs it, of course. Performance reasons, um, asynchronous code is really fast. The thing is that you can run multiple things at the time waiting for certain events. So instead of having serially check 10 HTTP calls, I can just run them all at the same time, the application can do other stuff, and there I, get the re I reap the results of all of them, which is really comfortable, and it's much higher performance, obviously. And offloading tasks, so I have some code that gets an input and throws it into a database but does more work at the same time, and there's another one, another event that runs all the time in the background working on that queued code. So offloading tasks is very useful in asynchronous code. This is kind of the end of the theoretical part. I wanted to give mainly the theoretical part, but I'm going to give another example of asynchronous code, and that's this, the, this stupid module. I had 20 minutes available, and I was bored, and I wrote this thing, and what it does, the, who here doesn't know XKCD? Good, I'm not gonna have to ask anyone to leave the room, I'm happy. All right, so, thank you. I, I really do appreciate it, because people get offended when I say leave, just don't. All right, so this module lets you use XKCD, because I saw they have an, an API, and no one actually wrote something that uses their API, so well, why not, I have 20 minutes to spare. So I wrote something that uses their API. And the, the, the funny part here is that it's able to do synchronous stuff with asynchronous stuff. So. The fetch method that you can see over there, you can just use fetch and get like the image and the comic which has like the metadata for it. But okay, you can also use fetch and give it a subroutine, it will run that subroutine whenever it gets it. And then you can do other stuff at the background. And I wanna show you how it's implemented. Fairly simple. Mm, let's look at fetch. Okay, this is fetch. Um, there's a parsing of arguments there because we don't have multi-methods in Perl. Uh, Jesse, you wanna get working on that or no? All right. Uh, if we had multi-methods, I wouldn't have to parse my arguments. Um, working on it. Working on it, all right, great. Um, so I'm gonna, this is just a placeholder until we have multi-methods. Um, so I check if I got a callback as, a, as an input and then I fetch the data and I give it another callback to parse it and then get the comic because it's different, you get first the metadata and then you have to get the comic, that's how it works, which is smarter, actually. And see, this is fairly easy. And once I have that, I can just return it. If I didn't get a callback, I just fetch the metadata, get, do a get there, and return it. Fetch metadata is somewhere around here, there it is. And it has the same thing because you can use fetch metadata separately, which was also an idea. So you can use either one. 
And it's fairly simple. If I get a call back, I do, I, do, I do a get there, I give it a code to run, which gets the body and it gets the uh, metadata and I decode it and then I call your code callback that you gave me with the information. It's like a simple example for asynchronous code. This time it's asynchronous and non-asynchronous just for fun. Um, I think I have spare time, do I? Does anyone know when I'm supposed to stop talking? Ten minutes till. Ten minutes till. All right, great. Does anyone have any questions? It's cool. We have time. You there, the brave soul. Oh yes, that's a good point. Um, you've probably seen that the mechanized example showed like a sub and then a sub and then a sub and then a sub and it kind of creates like an arrow paradigm there and it's kind of ugly. Um, I think this is much of design uh, decisions because what I would do is factor out the handling of similar events. For example, handling of, you'll notice here that instead of doing, um, if I want to do a fetch, that needs to get the metadata, that needs that to get the um, comic itself, and which needs then to run your callback. I'm getting like a fourth iteration there. What I did was just separated fetch metadata and fetch, and then I can use fetch and give it a callback to run. I'm only getting like two callbacks in there. That's it. And then in fetch metadata, I'm able to do the rest of it, and it only has one callback. So it's pretty cool. Another way is to just separate two subroutines and give references to those subroutines which always works. Um, there are, when you get into it, you find out different ways of doing it. It's, I haven't really got into an arrow in production code. So. Yes. Right, you need to pass, all right, so I didn't see, I, I didn't explain this in the slide that unfortunately did not work. Um, damn it, that free Mercury thing, it was worth it. Um, all right, so the thing here that I wanted to, to show is that the difference here is that I'm giving my dad as many, uh, as, as much information as possible up front. I'm saying, this is all you'll need to run. Leave me alone. Now, this is what happens with event loops, right? You, you just give it as many variables as you can up front and as many uh, code as you can for what to do up front, right? And then you say, I have to pass like 16 variables, what the hell? So I get that. But you have ways to control it. First of all, sometimes you have, um, Poe handles it clearly with the hip. So you say, that code runs in a context of a session which has its own hip for retaining any information you want. You don't have to pass them along, you can just put it in the hip, it'll have it. That's one really good way of handling it. Reflex uses moose, so you have attributes. Moose, plus plus, right, it's great. So you have, um, so you have that, it's another context. With any event in IO async, it's trickier, so maybe you have variables outside. I use any event with code that is object oriented. So I have, I put my own context into it, right? So maybe you put variables outside, maybe you send references to variables like you do with a recursive function, usually, sometimes. Um, maybe, you know, there are different ways of handling it. I guess those were. Another one, another brave soul, great. A lot of brave people here, it's just. There's IO Lambda, that guy wrote it. Um, it's another way. Yes. Right. I'll be honest, I wanted to show IO Lambda, but I had two qualms. Is that the right word? Um, this is not my native language. All right, great. So, I had two qualms. See me with my English vocabulary. Um, one is that I've never used it. And another half one is that I kind of didn't understand it at first, which happens with a lot of things for me. You know, like code, doors, I don't know, a lot of things. 
But I, the second reason is that um, I, I didn't have a lot of time, and apparently I had more time than I thought, but I, I didn't have as much time, and I also wanted to put Coro in for coroutines, which is another form, and I wanted to put threads in and forks and go nuts, but I, I didn't want to put so much into it. I basically wanted to give you like a understanding of how it works so you can use whichever one you want and interchange between them, just understanding how it actually works and how it does its thing. Any more questions? Awesome. I'm sorry, he's going to have to start. He's farther away and it was quicker. But, you know. <laughs> cool. What about what? I'm sorry. Dependencies? Right. You can use conditional variables. That's a good example. You can use conditional variables and you can say, I'm going to stop this application here and just wait for some other things to end. I'm going to give them a condition variable. They're going to call send on it when they're done. And I'm just going to wait here on a receive function. I'm just going to wait. And whenever you guys say send it, I'm going to continue running. Whatever I have in the background in the meantime still runs. It's cool. It will still run if you started things before that. But until that point, it's going to stop and wait. Usually, you would not use that. That's very useful, but a lot of the times what you want to do is just give it as much information up front, what to do when it's done, instead of you waiting for it to be done, like with my dad, who does that all the time. <laughs> all the time. All right, Christian. Why did I leave? Coro. Coro. Uh, same reason. Not because it's not good. No, seriously, not because it's not good. I just had a bit of um, trickiness understanding like the, the seed all the time. And it, we should. I want to learn it. Not, I won't necessarily use it, but I definitely want to learn it. Right. Knowing as many technologies as possible is definitely a, a good thing. Last question, or maybe last two questions. I don't know how much time I have. It's like, Larry, you have to watch it. Eight minutes? Did you say that like 30 minutes ago? What was that? <laughs> Eight and a half minutes. Oh, till 10. I see uh, listening, one of those things I have problems with. Um, so we have a few more minutes. If anyone wants to ask questions before I let you all go, do whatever it is you want to do here. Um, nothing at all. No one wants to get into, into any arguments. I'm down. What was that? I, I could barely hear it. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a good idea. You know, there is Pro on Android, so that's a good idea. We could do it. Yeah. Coming back to the dad example, I wonder if. The dad example. I'm going to be known for the dad <laughs> example guy. That's another option. That's, that's this thing. That's basically the condition variables. When you do it, just condition variable send, I'll receive if I don't, like, if I'm near my phone, which I probably won't be because I know you're going to call. But <laughs> my dad is a good guy. I'm sorry. I don't want to give him, like, a bad impression. He's a good person. Um, he just doesn't know how to get the movies. It, yeah. I love my dad. He's an awesome person. No, but probably because I'm not smart enough. Seriously, this is the answer. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. I'm using a lot of asynchronous code right now, and I'm loving it. But, and, I, and I use it occasionally with pre-forking. So I have even more power when I, pro, uh, I put out a few processes, each of them asynchronous, which is awesome. And then I'm thinking, asynchronous is how you should write everything. Like, I'm, I'm starting to talk to people in async. You know, it's, it, and it doesn't work. Well, but you know, I'm trying. The thing is, I'm probably not that experienced to take a look at something and say, you went how it is in the movies, full retard, you know that phrase? You went, you went full async, I don't know. So I'm, I'm probably not that adept in it to notice and to be able to identify it as much as other people. I'm, I'm assuming you, for example, would. So, but. 
Yes. No. No. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm, I like everything asynchronous. Almost everything, but yeah. I think, I think that's, oh, there's another one, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Why does this Freddie Mercury thing, I'm, I gotta show it, I, I'm sorry, it, this is, this really is, I, I was counting on this one to, to do everything. It, oh, it's not here, right, that, that, <laughs> that explains it, that, that might be it. Oh, it is, what? oh, okay, it doesn't want Firefox to open it, oh, great. Oh. See, there you go. No, this is not it. This is not Freddie Mercury. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a friend who loves Queen. He's going to be so mad. Um, somewhere. I, I know I have an index here. Oh, there we go. Uh, there it is. Reflex. Which one? This one or that one? That's one right here. All right. It's hot, isn't it? It's not just me, right? <laughs> Function, <laughs> method, <laughs> scalar, what? Okay. So you don't like, actually reconnect them from all the stack to the other and that's and that's the and that's the reference. And since it's a string, the reference that executes that method is that the right thing. I was wondering if uh, any of the uh, events would support that kind of uh, code. I would totally answer that, but I didn't, I didn't even understand what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the words, but I didn't get it. I'll, I'll explain it later. I, I got I got like closures. So yeah, closures are awesome, but <laughs> I kind of lost you after that point. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I suck. I <laughs> okay. I assume you can. I I think you might be able to do that. I'm I'm gonna wrap it up. Rocco, who wrote Poe and Reflex, would probably. Um, be able to answer that over the phone <laughs> or something. It's really good. So I, I think I'm done here. Thank you, and I'm sorry, but <laughs> thank you.